Um, so I basically uh, did a PhD training in uh, working on epigenetics, and then I did training in pediatrics and genetics, and I've been a faculty member at Johns Hopkins for four years. So in the time I talk is Kabuki syndrome, an update on ongoing research and therapeutic development. Next, please. So today I'm going to talk, give you a research update of what we've done with our mouse models, uh, which I think is uh, gives us a lot of hope, and I want to share that data with you. I, I want to briefly talk about some of the clinical observations that we've had on Kabuki syndrome, and I want to talk uh, about uh, just a couple of thoughts about how we can provide optimal care for patients with Kabuki syndrome uh, going forward. So next. So I want to start by saying, uh, what is DNA? So this is something I think about every day, uh, but some of you may not. So next. So DNA is the language of life. It's how cells know what to do. Next. And uh, the entire content of the DNA, we often call the book of life for the human genome. Next. Uh, and if the human genome is a book, the genes would be the words in that book. Next. And we've had this book of life for 15 years, and we still don't know how to read it completely. Next. So this is a, a, a picture of the book of life. And uh, this book has to be read in many different ways. And, and the reason why I say that, next, is that there are many different cells, and they all use the same book. And one way that you could achieve this, and obviously these cells have very different uh, functions and different components, and one way that you could achieve that next uh, would be if you would highlight the genes, pick out the genes that you need in one cell type, next, and use a different highlighter to, to mark the words for the genes that you want to use in a different cell type, next. And how is that actually done in cells, next. So, um, I argue that one way to think about the epigenetic machinery is that this is a highlighting system for the genome. So it kind of works just like what I was describing. It picks out the words that are needed for the different cell types. And if you don't have those highlighters, you can't use those words. There's nothing wrong with the words, but you just can't use them. So uh, epigenetic marks are these modifications of either the DNA or the associated proteins. Uh, they're known to be affected by the environment. I know there are many people interested in kind of nutrition, and that's kind of where that comes in. Uh, they're somewhat reversible, and they add to the information content of the DNA. And there are two types. One is called DNA methylation. I'm not going to talk about that today. And there's another group called histone modifications. Next. So DNA is not floating around in cells as a strand. It's packaged, and it forms this uh, uh, thing called the nucleosome. So DNA is wrapped around these proteins. The proteins kind of have these tails that stick out, and then these tails can be modified. Uh, and the big picture next to know here is that there are certain modifications that are seen in the open chromatin, so when, when it's accessible and you can use it. And there are other modifications that you see when the DNA is wrapped and you can't use it. Next. And uh, there are many of the chemicals that are being made in our body when we break down our food substances are actually the molecules that are put on these modifications. So uh, nutrition and the environment is going to affect these marks quite a lot. Next. So I just want to summarize here the first part. Epigenetics, I just want you to know that's something that uh, is thought to help us read the code of the DNA. Next. Uh, and uh, environment affects these marks quite a lot. Next. So what are then, what is the machinery that puts on these marks? So what is that? Next. So we have uh, in our bodies, we have these amazing machines that put on these modifications and help turn on and turn off the genes. One are called writers or highlighters. Next. Uh, there's also erasers, they remove these marks. Next. There's something called readers, so the body can know if the marks get placed. Next. And then there's something called remodelers, and these help kind of move the nucleosomes around. <coughs> Next. And uh, the way this works is that uh, a highlighter comes in, it turn, opens up chromatin, and that allows the chromatin to be opened. Next. It has to compete with the system that removes these modifications, so there's some kind of balance between the open and closed chromatin. Next. <coughs> 
uh, and then the writers, uh, the, the readers keep track of this. Next. Next. So, and the way this works, this is just a schematic of one nucleosome. So you have the histone proteins, and then you have these tails that are sticking out, and there are some modifications next, uh, such as there's something called histone acetylation, and that's seen only in open chromatin, shown here in green. Next. Uh, there's also something called histone methylation, uh, that is sometimes seen in open chromatin. This is H3K4 trimethylation, that's an open chromatin mark. Next. And then there are other methyl marks that are seen in closed chromatin. So we can recognize the marks when they, you know, the, the marks that are supposed to be in closed chromatin and the marks that are supposed to be in open chromatin. Next. So I just want you to know that the histone machinery has these machines, the writers, the erasers, readers, and remodelers. Next. And uh, there are many different histone modifications. It doesn't really matter what they're called. But there are these marks that we can measure, and they're put to these tails, and they help open up chromatin and turn on genes or turn off genes. So these words in the Book of Life you can only use if the marks are put on correctly. Next. So what then happens when these machines are broken? Next. And this is the basis of our clinic. It's a clinic that we run at Hopkins. It's called the Epigenetics and Chromatin Clinic. And we see patients that have imprinting disorders. These are disorders that are very well known. But then we see a lot of patients that have defects in these machineries, these machineries that put on these modifications. And the one that I'm going to focus on is, of course, Lucas syndrome. Next. So uh, these, are, these are disorders that have a broken cog, and that cog causes us not to be able to put all these uh, highlights or remove these highlights. Next. So uh, the purpose of this clinic, just to kind of give you a little plug of it, next is to build expertise. We want to be the best providers for Kabuki care. And by seeing many kids with Kabuki and adults with Kabuki, we hope to be that. Next. We want to learn as much as we can from the patient and the family. And I feel like I learn every time that I interact with the patient uh, family with Kabuki syndrome. Next. And we want to help educate other health providers about Kabuki syndrome and the related disorders. Next. So, and there's a lot of these disorders. So, uh, Kabuki is one, but there's now 44 that are similar. They all affect the uh, uh, machineries that put on these highlights or remove these highlights. And this is a complicated picture. It just kind of shows you how many uh, involve a writer, how many involve a eraser, a reader, and a remodeler. Uh, can you do next? Uh, there are 18 that are writers, next. Seven that are erasers, next. Uh, six that are readers, next. And 13 that are remodelers, next. And it's interesting, it's a very complicated figure. Kabuki syndrome is up here. There are two different causes. And it's this little spokes here in that wheel. But what they all have in common is this in yellow. If you look at that, they all have a yellow mark, which is intellectual disability. So they all have something to do, they all cause intellectual disability. And the other thing that we see is growth. So if you see the red mark here, that's the disorders where the kids are small. The green mark here are the kids that have more growth, they're too big. So those are the common themes that we see. And I think even though Kabuki is not so common, together these disorders are quite common and I think eventually they will become a target of a drug company or other people because individually rare, but together they're quite a common cause of, uh, of uh, intellectual disability. Next. Next. So I uh, just want to point out Kabuki syndrome is here. One cause is a writer, the other cause is a racer. Next. So what do these writers and erasers do? Next. So they affect these modifications that I was showing you. Remember the histone proteins, the tails are sticking out. We now have all these, we've found these broken machines that maintain these marks. Next. And they all cause intellectual disability. These are some of the faces of, of kids that have been diagnosed with these different disorders. Kabuki syndrome, Rubenstein Tavi, uh, something called Biedemann Steiner or Kleefstar syndrome. So different disorders, but I want you to know that there are more disorders out there. It's an emerging cause of intellectual disability. Next. 
So uh, these disorders are genetic disorders that disrupt the epigenetic machinery, so don't allow the genes to be used normally. Next. Uh, and they all seem to lead to intellectual disability and problems with growth. You know how kids with Kabuki syndrome tend to be smaller than their siblings? That's one of the things that we see for all of these disorders. Next. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, there's a lot of these factors, but they don't seem to be able to make up for the defect of just the loss of one. It's enough to lose one of these, even though every person has a gene from mom and a gene from dad. By losing one, you seem to get a disease, and that seems to be a defining feature of this group. Next. So, from here on, I'm just going to talk about Kabuki syndrome. So, we, everyone in this room knows Kabuki syndrome. Uh, there are two different causes. There's one called um, KMT2D, or MLL2. That's the more common form. The other one is called kdm 6 a And uh, the kids all are quite small. Uh, they often have facial flattening. They often have these beautiful eyes, um, as this child has long eyelashes, prominent ears, they're small, and they have feel finger pads. They, those are the typical features. Next. And the first cause that was found, and was only found um, six years ago, 2010, was a defect in this rider. So this rider puts on this open chromatin mark. Next. And then, a couple years later, they found that an eraser can lead to the same phenotype. And this eraser removes this close from the mark, H3K for chromatolation. So, if you don't put on something that opens chromatin and turns on genes, or if you don't remove something that closes genes, you get Kabuki syndrome. Next. Uh, next. So what we thought is that if normally there's a balance between open and closed chromatin, next. And in Kabuki syndrome, that balance is tilted, so that the uh, chromatin is more closed than in normal people, next. Maybe we could use drugs that were already available that were known to open up chromatin. Next. So to do that, we uh, have a mouse model. So we have mice that have Kabuki syndrome. They have a mutation in, in KMT2D or MLL2. And the mutation kills the function of uh, the methyl transfer. So they can no longer work as a, a highlighter. So the highlighting function is lost. Next. Uh, next. Uh, the mice have many features that remind us of our patients. Uh, the mice, uh, the kabuki mice are shown here in yellow, and they're smaller throughout their life. It starts early in life, and they're smaller throughout. The mice also have immune problems, which we see in our patients, and they have skeletal problems. Next. So one of the features we see in kabuki is that their shape of their skull is unusual, so they have unusual facial features. Next. And what we see in the mice, and this doesn't show very well, but we see some of the same abnormalities when we do x-rays of the mice. The skull shape of the mice is uh, unusual, just like it is in the patients with the Kabuki syndrome. Next. So uh, because we were dedicated from the start to develop therapies, we wanted to be able to measure the effect of those therapies. And uh, to do that, you have to work with mice uh, to, to start with. And, and we have these tests that we use for the mice. This is something called novel object recognition. So in this test, you put a toy in a cage with a mouse, two copies of that same toy, and the mouse can explore it. Then the next day, you put a new toy in the cage, and the mouse should spend more time with the new, cage, new toy because it remembers seeing the other toy before. Next. But when we did this for our mouse with Kabuki, we saw no difference in the first day, but the second day, the Kabuki mice spent less time with the new toy. So that suggested that there was a problem with their memory. Next. So we did another test of something called the Morris Water Maze. It's a tank, it's filled with water, and we teach the mice to find a platform they can't see. And then you do that for a full week, and then what you do is you remove the platform, and then you can pound off and the mice go through the area where the platform used to be. And when we do that next, what we see is that the Kabuki mice cross about half as often as do the regular mice. So just having that one change causes them to be worse at this task. Next. Uh, so just to summarize this, is uh, there are two types of Kabuki syndrome, and we think it suggests that there's a problem with opening chromatin, so putting on those highlights. Next. And the mouse model 
has many features of patients with Kabuki syndrome, and we have tests that we can keep track of as we test therapeutic agents. Next. So we wanted to also have cells that we could keep track of uh, during the test the studies. So we looked where this highlighter, KMT2D, was most prominent. And it turns out that there's, it's very prominent in an area of the brain called the granule cell layer, the dente gyrus, next. And this is a very cool area, next, because it's one of the few places where you keep making neurons throughout your life. So most neurons are made when ch children are, are, babies are born, you know, before birth and just after birth. But in this area, this is an area where we all make neurons even when we're 80. Doesn't matter, we keep making neurons there. Next. Next. So, uh, could you cut the light a little bit more? Uh, so it turns out we started looking at that area and we looked for this highlight. And, it, and when we looked at the kabuki mice and the regular mice, what we saw is that kabuki mice had less of a highlight in this area compared to the regular mice. Next. We could quantify that and show that it was different. But what we saw when we were doing these studies is that the layer itself was very thin in the kabuki mice compared to the regular mice. Next. So to, to figure, to study that, we sectioned throughout the brain of these mice, and we picked every fourth slice, and we calculated the volume of this layer. And then we could kind of compare groups next. And when we did that, we saw that the kabuki mice had a smaller layer in general, in the regular mice. Next. So then we asked, could it be that the kabuki mice are not making as many neurons in that area? So we stain for something that labels new neurons. It's called double cordon and shown in green. And you can see in the, the regular mice, there's a lot of these green cells. In the kabuki mice, there are many fewer of these green, uh, green cells. Next. And we could quantify that and show that the kabuki mice had less of these cells. Next. So then the question was, can we manipulate this? Can we show that we can increase the green cells in these mice? So here we've done a study, we've taken a full cohort of mice, and on top we have the regular mice, and on bottom we have uh, the kabuki mice. And what you see is when they've got no drug, we see this big difference. There's fewer green cells, less red mark. Uh, but as we increase the amount of the drug, so a drug called AR42, we could rescue this so that it was no different between the kabuki mice and the regular mice. Next. And when we quantified this, we saw that the kabuki was without the drug was much lower, had fewer of these cells. And as we increased the amount of drug, they caught up to the wild mice. Next. So does this matter? Does this affect the function? So we went back to that test the task that they do poorly at. It's called the Morris Water Maze. Remember, the kabuki mice did about half as well as the regular mice. On the drug, they both did better. That's something that's been described for these drugs. But now the kabuki mice did no worse than the regular mice. Uh, so next. So we have a mouse model of kabuki syndrome. We found an area of the brain which we think could participate in the intellectual disability. And we think the problem relates to uh, the mice are not making as many neurons as the regular mice. Next. And we could change this, we could affect this by giving a drug that rescues that epigenetic abnormality. By, by placing the right highlights and by turning on genes that are not being turned on, uh, we got a rescue of that phenotype. Next. So the problem with this is that the drug we used is a cancer therapeutic drug. And it, it's going to be hard, in some ways, to use a cancer drug for kids that have not a lethal disease, that just have a static intellectual disability. So we wanted to look for more options to see if we could find more agents that could work. Next. Next. And it turned out there was a recent paper when we were doing these studies that came out that suggested that there's a chemical in our body that is made by the body uh, that can do the same thing as the drug. It's an HDAC inhibitor, that's what it's called. And what this figure shows is that the more of this chemical, it's called beta hydroxyburate, the more of these open chromatin highlights you get. Next. 
So our idea was, could we either inject this to the mice, it's a natural occurring uh, chemical in our bodies, or could we, could we do a diet that would increase the levels of this, that would fix the problem that we have next. Uh, and what would help us for this is that this chemical is transported into the brain by the body itself, so it naturally crosses the blood-brain barrier, next. And um, uh, this diet is already used for a lot of things, right? especially for seizure disorder. It's called the ketogenic diet, next. So we started to see whether some of the same markers of disease could be fixed on the ketogenic diet. We first looked at the uh, histomastellation, so that's one of the highlights. There's a big difference, the kabuki have less than the regular. Next, on the diet, that, that got better. Next, uh, same is true for histomethylation. That's the particular mark that is defective in kabuki syndrome. Big difference on the regular diet. Next, on the, on the ketogenic diet, there was a rescue there. They improved. Next, so what about those green cells? Remember the green cells? There's a big difference on the regular diet between the regular mice and the kabuki mice. There are many fewer here. Uh, in the kabuki mice, uh, but on the ketogenic diet, next, you see that there's a rescue of this. So now we have more green cells in the kabuki mice, and not that different from what we see in the regular mice. Next. And this is a quantification of that. Um, you know, big difference on the regular diet, a much smaller difference on the ketogenic diet. Next. So we wanted to do it with many different ways. This was a different way than the double cordon, because maybe there's something wrong with the double cordon that we don't understand. So this is a way where we inject the mice with a chemical, it's called EDU, and that chemical gets taken up by the cells, and it tells us how many new cells are being made in that area. So kind of how many new cells are being made by a different method. You can see the kabuki mice, uh, mouse has fewer cells, the regular mice has more cells on the regular diet. Next, on the ketogenic diet, we got a pretty nice rescue of that. Many more dots, positive dots. So now the kabuki mouse looks more like the regular mouse. Next. And you can see the quantification, big difference on the regular diet, uh, some normalization on the ketogenic diet. Next. Uh, we wanted to test the memory too. Remember we did the Morris water maze. Again, we saw this deficiency. The kabuki mice do worse on the regular diet. Next, on the ketogenic diet, they do no worse than the regular mice. Next. So then we, the last thing we wanted to ask, and I'm going to stop you know, giving you all this science uh, soon and talk about something else, but we wanted to see whether it was truly the beta hydroxybutyrate or something else in the diet. Next. So to do that, we injected the mice with beta hydroxybutyrate, and uh, we started out by giving one injection, and this is the mice on the ketogenic diet, they have levels of beta hydroxybutyrate that are a little bit higher, but at least we got some in there with one injection, next. Uh, and what we saw after one injection is we saw some normalization, not as good as the diet, but some uh, improvement, next. So then we went ahead and we injected the mice three times a day, Next, and there we saw almost complete rescue. So the more beta hydroxybutyrate you have, uh, the better this marker of the disease does. Next. So the summary here is, next, uh, we, uh, we see these defects in neurogenesis and problems with the memory in a mouse model kabuki syndrome, and they get better on this diet. Next, uh, when we inject this chemical, we also rescue this phenotype, and it gets better the more we inject. Next. So I think this ma makes it plausible that, you know, this is another proof that there seems to be some reversibility even after birth in uh, mice with Kabuki syndrome. Next. So I always get two questions, and I'm going to answer them before you ask them. One is, does this apply to humans? And the second is, what will be treatable? Next. So the first is, do our findings apply to humans? So um, uh, it is possible. There's a lot of things that work in mice that don't work in humans. That's just uh, to be honest about it. And, uh, but if, um, we, if this problem with making new neurons is a big 
component of the intellectual disability in Kapuki syndrome, we should be able to show this by studying patients. Next. Uh, and Jackie, which you're going to hear about uh, soon, uh, she's been doing studies to test this hypothesis. So she has the older kids come in, they do tests that test that region of the brain, and she's getting close to publish that work. She's done about 20 patients at this point, and it looks quite promising. Um, she'll, she may show you some more. She's also doing uh, studies to prepare for a clinical trial, uh, both MRI studies, and uh, also um, she's looking into anxiety as a possible measurement for a clinical trial. So we are moving in that direction. Uh, we need help with that. Um, for the MRI to work, we especially need kids that are old enough that they won't be stressed out in the scanner and are willing to spend some time in the scanner, maybe be scanned more than once. Because we, if we can fine tune the scanner before we start doing a lot of kids, our likelihood of success is going to be better. Next. Um, and the other benefit of this, I think uh, what Jackie learned, and she's going to talk more about this, is that if we can understand some of the strengths and weaknesses of Kabuki syndrome, I think we can optimize some of their educational experiences. I think we could give maybe general, everyone is unique, but it would be nice if we could give some general guidelines to the providers and the educators. Next. So what would potentially be treatable? So uh, we may be able to treat uh, the memory defect if we prove this in the patient. Uh, the low muscle tone and the immune problems, those would be possibly treatable things. Next. We're never going to be able to treat this. Next. We're never going to be able to treat things that happen early in development. The heart, the kidneys, the orthopedics, the eye, or the finger pads. That's never going to change. We're not going to change the child. But my, our thoughts with this is we think Kabuki syndrome has such amazing strengths that if we could tweak just a little bit, we might be able to open up their opportunities quite a lot. Next. We're never going to change their facial features. That's not going to change the history. Next. And uh, I just want to say once more, this we are anxious to have other labs repeat our studies. And uh, we want to wait for what we see from the human studies before we recommend any treatment at this point. Next. So next, I just wanted to run through uh, some of our clinical observations from the you have a question? Uh, some of the clinical observations that we have from our clinic. Next. So we have this big clinic. We've been fortunate to see a large number of patients, probably 20 to 30 patients in the clinic. I've seen many more at the conferences. So what have we learned? Next. Uh, next. So uh, the hearing is very important, and you all know this. Uh, but we, uh, we target this in a couple of different ways. Uh, there are many of the patients that have hearing loss. Some of the patients even have hearing loss early in life. We think that the infections play some role, but we think also there's some underlying problem with the hearing. So uh, it's something that we, for the younger kids, we do aggressive monitoring of their hearing, and we treat the ear infections. Even though it's bad to use antibiotics, in this group we tend to treat them. The other thing that we learned is that kids with Kabuki don't respond to the pneumococcal uh, uh, vaccination, so some of the vaccinations don't take. So it, what we've started to do is we measure when the kids come to our clinic whether the vaccination worked, and then if it didn't work, we give them an extra booster, uh, and that protects them both for the lung and the ear infection. So I think that's a very important thing. Next. Uh, the hypotonia, which many of the younger patients know all about, the low muscle tone, that seems to get better. Uh, and, uh, but what this does is that it often makes the child look um, worse off than it really is. You know, if you have low muscle tone, you're not going to be able to do the gross motor skills. You're not going to be able to talk. So sometimes the parents get um, uh, horrendous uh, predictions. Uh, the physicians will say this child is never going to do anything, blah, blah, blah. And the parent, and what we worry about is that the parent stops stimulating that child. What that child needs is as much stimulation, just as you heard so beautifully in the speaker before me, 
not less stimulation. And that has been a little bit of a trend. Many of you may have heard such things, you know, uh, you know not uh, needs, uh, need an a eye examination. Some of the kids also sleep with uh, their eyes open, sometimes because of the, you know, uh, anatomical features of their eyes. Uh, some of the, uh, there can be problems related to this. We use drops to, to help with that. Next. Uh, spine, some of the kids have had scoliosis, so kind of bending of the spine. So that's something that we usually don't x-ray, but we sometimes do x-rays if there's a big curvature. It's very important to pick that up when the kids are young, because as they go through growth spurts, sometimes the spine um, scoliosis can get worse. So we just want to know about it early on. Next. Next. Oh, feeding problem. Sorry. Go back. Um, so this is very common. I don't think we understand it completely. Uh, there's two points I want to make here. One is many of the kids uh, are not going to fall on your regular growth chart. And some of the doctors that are going to manage your kids are going to think that that's bad. But often it's just a feature of the Kabuki syndrome. And we don't want those kids to be overfed. We just want the kids to get enough calories to sustain their growth. Because what we've seen is that if you overfeed kids that are, and you force them up on a different curve, they're going to have obesity when they get older. And that's not going to help anyone. That can lead to other problems down the road. So, uh, and the other thing is if we have kids that have massive feeding problems, we often play with formulas and do other things, but we often, just want to make sure to check. Some of the kids have clefts, so if that hasn't been looked up, especially with the younger kids. Yes? Uh, excuse me, what about growth hormone? So uh, there's some, supposedly there's a study, so there's been some incidental work uh, with growth uh, hormone. Uh, there have been some uh, sporadic reports where people have tested on very few patients, uh, and the jury's out whether it helps. It's not clear based on the published whether it helps. However, supposedly there's a study in the Netherlands that is about to come out, and uh, I heard a rumor that the uh, results were promising there. So we'll see what they uh, what comes out of that. But currently, it depends a little bit on whether your insurance will cover it. Um, the only thing that I want to say with growth hormone is that if you're going to consider that. Uh, uh, you should do a sleep study for the child before because sometimes sleep apnea, which is common in kids that have low muscle tone, can get worse with growth hormone. So you just want to do a sleep apnea, apnea test before you start to work. So, uh, next. So the final thing, because I've already taken up a lot of time and covered a lot of stuff, and I'm happy to take any questions afterwards, I just wanted to talk about a couple of things how we can, you know, like I said, it's been a privilege to be part of this community. Uh, we want to do everything we can to try to help. And I just wanted to talk about a couple of thoughts that I have about how we can work together to improve things. Next. Um, one is we, I encourage you to participate in research, not only with us, but if other people are um, uh, doing studies. We have, for kids that have already had the two genes tested and didn't have a mutation, we have a study to look for a third gene. We think there's a third gene for Kaluski, but we haven't found it. The first two really helped us understand the disease. It's possible that the third gene could give us some clues into how to uh, focus the therapeutic effect. So I think that's important. Next. Uh, I think it's important to fundraise, uh, especially for people that are starting off. This can be a way to get junior investigators to buy into Kabuki. We need to attract more uh, people to work on it. Uh, I also think um, it's important, uh, some of the amazing work um, uh, that they're doing in Alaska with uh, all the community support. Uh, I think there are many reasons to fundraise. And it can be to help people come to conferences, to hold bigger conferences, uh, to allow some of the individuals to meet one another. And I, I can only tell you how precious it has been to me to attend this. Uh, I imagine it's been the same experience for, for most of you. So next, uh, I think it's, uh, I think organizing meetings like this one is very, very important. Uh, we were so fortunate that there was a, a parent, Dana Levinson, who organized a meeting for us at Hopkins. We had 200 part participants, which was amazing. We had, we had more that wanted to come at that point. 
uh, but we had to cut off because Hopkins was about to throw me out of the institution. <laughs> As I kept kind of growing, I started with 10 families and then ended up being a lot of people. But we couldn't have done it up without Dana Levinson, and uh, I think there are some ideas within the community to maybe come up with a national conference. And I think if we had a national conference, it doesn't mean we would have to stop the local conferences, but maybe we could stream the information Mom. so that people Mom. could uh, log in online and hear with a national meeting. And maybe we could get more providers to come and, and so forth. But, so I think that's a great um, thing. Next. I, I think it's also important to lobby for Kabuki syndrome. I think um, there's not a lot of awareness. It's getting better, but I can't tell you how many patients email me or come and they say, you know, my doctor had never heard about Kabuki syndrome, and uh, what he did when I came into his office is he Googled Kabuki syndrome. He just basically told me it was the first page, you know, from his Google search. And any parent can do a more <laughs> thorough search than that. So I think, you know, we work hard to try to um, teach. And, you know, other, you know, health professionals about Kabuki syndrome. But I think in your community it is important to, to kind of raise the flag for Kabuki syndrome. And I know, I know many of you are doing amazing things for that. But I, I just think it's very valuable. And I think, you know, that could be at any different levels. Uh, public uh, health providers, lawmakers, and funders. Uh, it, by, you know, when you have a disorder, and Kabuki is not the most rare disease that we see, not in my field. We have many diseases that are much rarer than Kabuki, but yet have more press. So it's not always related to how prevalent the disease is. Sometimes it's just a matter of you know whether someone has kind of you know publicized that disorder. Next, and uh, we've done some of that. We participated in something with something called the Rare Genomics Institute, and um, I was so amazed with this. We did this in 2013. And uh, we had a proposal, and you were supposed to get votes uh, for that. And people were supposed to vote for their favorite disease. And we were in second place. Uh, we got killed by uh, Rett syndrome. But, but the important thing is we got 12,000 people. And I know some of you in the audience voted here, but 12,000 people you know, selected Kabuki that, That's I think that's an amazing number. And uh, we were uh, shocked. Uh, this was a, you know, I think it was a 10 day thing or something, and within those 10 days, 12,000 people clicked on the so That means that 12,000 people were thinking about the Kabuki syndrome at that minute. So, uh, next. So, uh, I wanted to end up with this. Uh, this is uh, 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 a, a painting that I got at the Texas um, meeting that I went to. It was uh, done by a high school student. It's pretty impressive. And uh, it has the green colors, uh, the kabuki colors. It has the one of the slogans, impossible is nothing, which I really like. I, I, I put this painting at the exit of my lab so that the students are more hesitant to leave. It's like uh, stimulating them to stay in the lab. Uh, it has the kabuki symbol. And what the young artist, uh, Kedizia Barrett, said that... The... Ara! Yes? <laughs> um, what, what she said is that the, the child is a child of Kabuki syndrome, the tear represents uh, some of the challenges, but the butterfly is the hope on the horizon. And I, I really, really like that. So I was uh, thrilled when they gave me this uh, portrait. So, uh, next. So these are all the people. You see there's a lot of people uh, involved in this work. Uh, the, the work that I did was mainly a single student in my lab, Joel Benjamin. He's now gone to uh, other things, uh, but still thinking about Kabuki syndrome. We have two younger students that are working on some of the uh, follow-up studies. We uh, have encouraged another young faculty member to work on the growth issue. Her name is Jill Farner. Uh, uh, there are other labs that have become involved. We've got help from the Department of Psychiatry biostatistics, um, and uh, I, I didn't include Jackie here, but she should be here, but you'll, you'll hear from her as well. And, and, and there's a ton of people that help with the clinic, and uh, um, um, we have received some very nice funding from uh, something called, uh, this was a young investigator grant, but then we got something called the Early Independence Award, which we still have a couple years left of, and then we got a really nice gift from uh, a family, um, uh, that will help us do some of the diet stuff. 
and we've got uh, many other uh, small donations. And we're very grateful for that. It's very, very helpful. So that's all I was going to say, but I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Yes. I, um, I know I've got really small discussions about this, um, but as a parent of, um, well, I'm from a pediatric nurse, which I you know is very helpful with Elisha. But um, one of our biggest problems with Eli, he was going away from a lot of the medical complications that came with him. He's undergone two open births, um, multiple surgeries. The biggest issue has been the GI problems. It's been linked to so many things. And it's kind of a question slash comment for you is getting the position you're in, getting a GI doctor to be involved with research, because I think a lot of things are linked with the GI tract. Um, the reflux, the blood, um, the immune issues. And I know I told you and some other people at the conference last year, we saw a huge difference going, because Eli is too fed, um, going from regular formula to a blood rice diet and now liquid with nourish, which is real food. Saw so a huge difference in function, he was healthier, um, cognitively started taking off. Um, and so, and all the other families, there's so many other families that have since made the switch, immediately are seeing these results. And it's helped so many other parts of his life, much better quality of life. Um, Potential of getting a GI specialist on board with research to either work with you or to help advocate for our community because, like us switching to a formula that's all real foods, it's such a, a battle with insurance companies and DMEs providing it. But the more people that are getting put on it yeah. and you're seeing these huge results, it might help other families like ours get the coverage and have a DME. So that's my question it's about GSI. So I think that's a great question, um, and I think um, you know, I think we need to cultivate um, expertise within the community, and, and one way to do that is to attract by having bigger conferences. It's easier to get physicians to come. The bigger the conference, the, and I think you need to grab uh, a GI doctor when they're young. Like, like Jackie, she got interested in Kabuki while she was a fellow, and now she's going to take that on her own and run with it. With a GI thing, I think it's a real phenomenon, and um, I don't understand it completely. I think it could be complex because it could relate to the immune problem. So the immune problem um, uh, that we found in our mice, we've worked a little bit with uh, Andrew Lindsley, and I'm dabbling with immunology, which I'm not an immunologist, but I'm working with him. And we found that some of the gut immunity seems to be abnormal. So maybe the flora is abnormal too. And, uh, but I, I think it would be great. And one of the things that I was suggesting to the group as they were discussing how to go forward was it's easy to cultivate talent that you want uh, in some ways. For instance, if you have a small fund that you're going to, say you're going to take five, you fundraise five or ten thousand dollars, you could just put out an advertisement where you say, we want a GI, only GI doctors that are going to work on Kabuki on this problem are eligible for this fund. And then you'll have 10 GI doctors think about Kabuki. They'll send in a proposal, and one of them will uh, get the money, and then he'll come the next year and present about his findings. So that's one way to kind of cultivate that expertise. But uh, I always try to listen to, you know, the problem with some of these studies, and I'd love to do more kind of GI uh, type studies, is that each uh, study takes quite a lot of time, it's quite expensive, and, and, uh, and some of it is outside of my expertise. So. But I haven't discussed with GI doctors, I haven't found anyone that, you know, I think is going to be our champion. But we need a GI, we, we, it would be nice to have champions of all specialties, you know? Uh, I, mean, I think we have an immune champion now. Yeah, Hannibal and Lindsay are both kind of immune uh, champions for uh, Kabuki. Both of them are quite, uh, have been following uh, Kabuki for a long time and are interested. Hannibal is obviously much more senior, and uh, Lindsay is one of the junior guys. Uh, but, uh, but we need champions, uh, endocrine <coughs> uh, champion, uh, 
um, and, you know, uh, for the GI, you need other champions. Maybe an orthopedic uh, champion. You know, it would be nice to have people that are committed and see more than one or two kids because, you know, how good are you going to be if, um, if you've only seen one other child? You know, you're not going to get a feel of it. And I think it could cross over to so many other. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and one of my hopes is that even though community is rare by itself, I think that some of these disorders have a lot of overlapping things. And, you know, our idea with our clinic was it was kind of a backwards clinic. People were like, what, what do you mean? You're going to have a clinic for kids that are already diagnosed? That makes no sense. Genetics does diagnosis. But I think genetics also does a lot of quarterbacking for kids. And we wanted to have a clinic where we would attract and we would get good at a limited number of conditions, and we'd be really good at that. And I think it's helped us a lot for Kabuki, and we're starting to see some other related disorders that we've seen more of than anyone else. And I think that's a good way to, I think other people are starting to work on it, so. Other questions? It's always worrisome if no one asked. That means that no one understood what the problem <laughs> I have a curiosity question. You've been talking a lot about raising the awareness um, have an impression of what type of prevalence in the population within the United States is. Yeah, uh, the, the prevalence we always use is 1 in 30,000, you know, which Yay. in my world is uh, not super rare. That's relatively common. The most common genetic disease that we follow is like 1 in 10,000. And then we have many that are less than a one in hundred thousand, so kabuki is not uncommon. The problem with kabuki is that the features are not super specific. You know, yes, the eyes, but a lot of kids have blue eyes, and uh, you know, yes, they're short, but a lot of kids are short, and yes, they have a hypotonia, but a lot of kids have, you know, so, uh, but there's this new tool, which is called exome sequencing. You know, now we can sequence the book of life without knowing which genes to look at. We can just look at all of them. And we are finding so many kids with that test. So that means that as physicians, we're not really good at diagnosing this. And I think, you know, we've just seen an explosion. And I've seen this in the patient support groups too. You know, there used to be a limited number of families. Now that you see new families almost every week. And uh, so I think, I think it's more common than I thought. But one in 30,000 is more than It's not based on a lot of data. And we try, you know, we do our share, we try to go to conferences and, and talk about Kabuki syndrome when we can. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, we should raise awareness on many different levels. So, those questions, yeah. What? I was just wondering what the specific cancer drug is that you identified. Yes. So, uh, I picked a drug called AR42. It's, all, it, it, it's a drug that is FDA approved. The reason why I picked it, it was a very powerful drug. So it, uh, it opens up chromatin very well, better than almost any other drug that I could find. Also, it was known that it crossed into the brain, and people had put mice on them for two years, and the mice didn't get any bad effects from being on it. And, but I want to, you know, it is a cancer drug, but we're using it at a very low level. So the cancer dose is about tenfold of what we're using at. So it wouldn't be the end of the world to use that, but I think we can get to more specific agents. It's a big gun agent, and I think you know the diet stuff has taught us that we don't have to shoot, use a cannon. We might be able to use a small gun to kind of get the job done. So my granddaughters have seen um, retested. Yep. For it's it's a different drug, uh, but it also uh, that drug also kind of uh, keeps down proliferating cells. So, but this drug in the dose that we use, um, and we don't know yet whether it will work for the immune problem. You're kind of hinting at this. Could could our drug also work for the immune things? And I think that's a super important question. Uh, what we've been trying to do now is to figure out if we can measure the immune problems robustly. Because if what we see in the patients is that there's a lot of immune problems, but they're different in different kids. 
But in the mice, uh, we have started to find some features that are consistent. So we think we can start measuring that. And uh, it's my hope that we get to that question at some point. Do you have a question about the Okay. Um, okay, so I'm right. Yes. Yeah, yeah.
would everybody want to take a quick break for a moment or anything before we get into this? Or I'm getting off shakes.